Y'all ready for the word? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I always have the privilege of introducing a man who needs no introduction. This man runs in so many circles. He won't tell you this, but he's busy. The future mayor of Santa Fe. The dynamic evangelist. Our brother. Our boy. Chevy Chavarria. Um, we're going to start here. We're, we're, we're going to be in Romans, by the way. So if you have a Bible, open up Romans 12. We're just going over the first couple of uh, uh, verses in there. But I'm going to let you get that. I'm going to start right here. And um, uh, I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to end with the same thing we start with. So we're going to go on this crazy journey. And we're going to come right back to the beginning. It's going to be fun. Uh, maybe. I don't know. You might hate it. Who knows? Um, Let's go. Your life is a response to what you really think about God. Just, you don't have to tell anybody what you think about God. You don't have to buy the t-shirt. It doesn't matter what anybody says, anybody else says about you. People will just know. Your life is a response to what you really think about God. Amen. The way you treat people, the way you talk to people, the way you, husbands, the way you love your wives. Everything. Your life. Wives, the way you respect your husbands, your life is a response to what you really think about God. We're going to be in Romans 12. Sorry if I'm squeezing. Romans 12 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get weird on it. Does anybody have a crazy tattoo story? Do you have a tattoo? Maybe you got when you were 18 and you were like, oh, this is my story, or something that really means a lot to you. Anybody in here with the tattoo? Anybody have show hands, tattoos, tattoos? Nobody's judging. Nobody's judging. No tattoos? What is it? That's right. So I, uh, I, I was going to say, I thought everybody would be like, oh, I think it's a weird. Most of the people I know in the world, I feel odd because I don't have one, right? And, and most everybody I run with, I've seen in my life, they're covered in tattoos or have whatever. And there's like, oh, some people are like, I have 57 tattoos and they're all like this big. I'm like, I don't know if that counts as 57. That might be one collectively, you know. I remember being, um, I don't know, I was probably like 20, 19, somewhere around there. And a friend of mine said, uh... You guys pay for it, and I'll get whatever you want. A, a, a bunch of dudes sitting around one night with nothing to do. So there's a grown man about 40 years old walking around Santa Fe, Texas, with a grim reaper on his back. And that grim reaper is sitting on a toilet. And around that toilet, there's a, there's a, there's a, a toilet paper flying around, and there's a caption that says, what died? True story. Just a bunch of dudes sitting around, and he's like, it's on my back. I don't got to look at it. To this day. Like, to this day, and I'm like, oh, Lord. So I tell you that story to be like, I, I was, uh, uh, I don't know, probably a couple years after that. I was like 21, 22, and um, I, I really thought I was saved, and I was, I mean, I, I was I was in love with the Lord, and, and I was like, I saw this guy, and he had a tattoos right here on his biceps, and it's like really painful, soft spot, and he just said, you flex, and it would say, make sacrifices, and I was like, oh, I've. I love that. In my head, I was like, I'm a young 
Christian guy and I'm in this punk rock scene, right? So I'm like stuck in the middle. I tell you all the time, like I was in this punk rock scene. So punk rockers hated me for being Christian and the Christians hated me for being like in this punk rock scene. I could just never win no matter what I did. And so I was like, but you know what? I'm going to get a tattoo for the Lord. And this tattoo, people are just going to look at it and they're going to get saved. That's what's going to happen. It's going to be about Jesus. They're going to look at this tattoo. First of all, I'm like 21 years old. Up until like recently, I started wearing like basketball jerseys. I've never shown my arms, the, the top of my arms. So I don't know what I was thinking at the time. But at the time, I was like, no, no, no. This is going to be it. I am going to tr just just change the world with my Jesus tattoo. People are going to look at I mean, you know, the, you know what they always say, like, you know, always preach the gospel. And if necessary, use the words. This tattoo was going to be it. So I, uh, uh, I'm like, no, I'm in. Like, I got this crazy idea. I found the fourth best tattoo artist in Texas. Why? Because one, two, and three were way too expensive. I couldn't, uh, number four I was good with. Like, he was in my price range. Top three, not happening. I, I drove this tattoo shop in, in Houston. And back in the day, I'm like, I'm like, again, I'm 20 years old. I was waiting tables. To put gas in my car to get to Houston was a huge deal. And we didn't have Google Maps. Like, we had, like, MapQuest. You had to print out. It's like, you know what I'm saying? You had to get on a computer, you had to print out a thing and the way you drive and try to read the directions and get there. It's like, it's like you're risking your life for this thing. So I'm, I'm again in my head, I'm, I'm making sacrifices, baby. I'm about to make, take the pain of this tattoo. I'm risking my life driving there, trying to read the paper and get there. Like it's a big deal, right? So I get to this tattoo, um, this, this tattoo place. And again, it was like it was like a, one of the cleanest tattoo places in Houston. Um, that's mainly because of this lovely lady sitting back there, my wife, because she was uh, a germaphobe. And I'm like, hey, I'll go to this place behind the U-Haul. I'm good, like whatever. And she's like, no, no, you're not. We were, we were dating back then. And you go to this tattoo place, and they had like surgical masks, you know. And uh, I was like, ooh, like before before COVID, they were still wearing surgical masks. It was, it was different, you know. And um, so I show up and I tell this guy this idea for my tattoo that is going to change the world around me. And so I, I tell this dude I wanted a, you know what a sacred heart is? So it's like a heart with a cross on it and there's like a flame. But I wanted like a real heart, not like a shape of a heart, but like a veiny, like with the things on top, you know, whatever. And so I wanted this heart and there's a cross and there's fire and in between, like the fire's going to go between these two doves and they're going to have this like one wing like this and one wing like this and they're going to have halos and then inside that heart there was going to be like a Jesus fish and the Jesus fish light was going to be shooting out of this Jesus fish it was going to be shattering the heart and it was going to have a banner around it there was this lyric to this song that I really like and the song in the lyric it said it said they'll say we love the darkness but I say we had to hate the half light and at 20 I thought that was so deep like because I was in the punk rock and I'm like people look at me and they judge me but I'm looking at them and they're not even living for Jesus so it was like this whole like I'm really sticking it to the man concept and so I tell this tattoo artist like this is what I want he's like bro you know he's like, dude you know whatever and so and my, my arms are like chunky right so they're beefy and he was just and then I never went outside so it was like real white and pale and he was like yeah I can put so much color in it and he was hyped and I was hyped and he's like yo you gotta give me a couple weeks man because I'm super busy again fourth best tattoo artist in Texas number four I'm just telling you and so um I uh I was like cool I was waiting tables so I said look it's gonna be a while because Houston back then was it was a big deal to get to Houston. So it's going to be a while before I get back to you. You know, he's like, give me a couple weeks. So cool. I give him a hundred bucks. Back then, that was some, I earned two thirteen an hour plus tips. You know what I mean? Like hundred bucks was the deal. I'm like, I'm dedicated. Make sacrifices, right? So a hundred bucks, I'm giving this dude a hundred bucks and I'm going back. And so we had this conversation. He said, I can't talk to you for a couple weeks. Maybe three, four weeks later, he calls me and says, dude. Dude, I got this tattoo I designed and I sketched it out. And I'm like, okay, I can't get back to you for a couple weeks. I had all these shifts, right? So now it's been about a month and a half, maybe two months before from our initial meeting. And I get back to that tattoo shop. And I walk in and I'm like, this guy has my tattoo ready. And uh, uh, the uh, guy behind the counter, or the girl behind the counter, I can't remember what's this. Oh, you didn't hear? And I'm like, hear what? And they go, oh, this tattoo artist, well, he, he ran off with our piercing girl. Her name was Butterfly, and she thought she had some weird disease. And she went to go die in the woods in Canada. I'm like, are you, are you kidding me right now? I gave this dude a hundred bucks. Like, what are you talking about? They're like, come here. And they show me his, his room that he's working on stuff. And he left his 
his needles and his inks and his portfolio and I'm flipping his portfolio and I'm, I'm looking at these other tattoos that he's done and there's like this board on the wall of all these sketches and stuff he's working on and there's a big empty spot in the middle and they go, that's where your tattoo was. He goes, that was one of the best tattoos I've ever seen him design. That's the only thing he took out of this shop. He was married. He left his wife and kids. She left her boyfriend. They went to Canada for her, for her to die in the woods and the only thing he took was my tattoo. Praise God. I'll come back to that. We're in Romans. He says, he says, Romans 12, 1. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, he says, therefore, I urge you. Has, has anybody ever told you, like, check your source? You ever meet a guy who kind of talks to you about Jesus, but you look at his life and you're like, I don't know, bro. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to listen to you. Like, I just don't, I don't, be cool. Like, you know, and it's always those guys that start off like, you don't need to go to church. I, okay, I get what you're saying, but I, let me just straight up tell you, I've never met anybody who's passionate about Jesus who didn't want to be with their body who didn't want to be with their family, who didn't want to iron sharpen iron, who didn't want to grow. I've never met that guy. They're out there. I meet them all the time. The, you don't have to go to church, guys. I meet them all the time. But they're not the guys I'm really listening to. Do you know what I mean? I'm listening to guys who, who I see, like, live this life, right? you got to check your sources. The writer of Romans is a gentleman named Paul who happened to write most of the New Testament. Paul's one of the most intriguing people of the Bible to me. Paul actually used to be a guy named Saul who actually wanted nothing to do with Christianity with a zeal. He hated Christianity so much that he would actually murder people. He would go and kill people that believed in Christianity. Like this is this dude's heartbeat. And Jesus radically changed his life. And he went from wanting to murder you for the very thing that we believe, the very thing that we stand on, the thing that keeps us going almost every day, the reason we gather, the reason we raise our hands, the reason we sing to the heavens because we want to see our God move in our life, the reason behind all that, he wanted to stop that until Jesus changed his life. And now he became one of, one of, the, one of the forefathers, one of the greatest movements that centuries and centuries and hundreds of thousands of years were still a part of. That's the dude I want to listen to. So when he says, hey, I urge you, that's the guy when my ears perk up. Not, not a dude on YouTube who's like, hey, I got, God's telling me something. Do you know what I mean? No, no. I'm going to go back to, to the thing that's been around for a long time, the thing that has weight, the things that people got together and prayed about and, 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 and that I believe have the very same power of creation that sit between those pieces of leather. I'm going to go back to the Word of God, and this is written by a guy named Paul who literally we, we wouldn't be here without. So when that dude says, I urge you, my ears perk up. So when we start reading, look at these words. Therefore, I urge you. There's an urgency, y'all. There's a movement. Like, I need to get there. Y'all been in the grocery store? And you're maybe behind somebody who's not, doesn't have an urgency, but you got to go, right? And there's like the, uh, this 97-year-old lady that I, who, how did she get here? Did she drive herself? I don't know. And now she's in my way with my shopping cart. And there's a piece of you that kind of wants to run her over just to get her out of the way. But you remember that you're saved and you can't do that. So you go this way and she goes that way. And you're like, I got to go. But then we come to things about, we just got to go because we're missing our favorite TV show. We got a place to be, whatever. But when it comes to things of God, sometimes we aren't as urgent as we need to be. Right. So here's Paul. Like, hey, let me, let me tell you something. There's an urgency. There's something important about to happen. So pay attention. Right. He says, uh, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy, by the mercies of God. Think about this. So now he's like, let's go. Let's move. There's something about to happen by the very mercies of God, the mercy that God bestows on you, his grace, the things you don't deserve, but God gives you anyways because he loves you. By these mercies, pay attention. Again, my ears are perking up when I read this because God is, because Paul is saying there's something important happened. By the very mercies of God themselves, the things that save your soul, he put his mercy onto you. Like these are important things, right? You ever, you ever, seen somebody go i swear on my mother's grave and their mom's really dead you're like this dude ain't playing this dude is not playing this man is for serious right he just said on my mother's grave this is kind of that vibe this paul is saying by the mercies of god pay attention to what i'm saying this is the depth that i want you to understand i want you to pay attention i want your ears to perk up as he's writing to the romans he says uh 
He says, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living and holy sacrifice. This, this is where it gets uncomfortable in our walk with God. And I'm here, I'm here to maybe say like, if, if you're not really ready to step out of your comfort zone, if you just want to do the same old thing, this might not be the spot for you. You know what I'm saying? I, I really pray and hope that we are designed and we are a people and we are a family and we are a church group that is constantly on a hunger and, and a quest to go deeper with our Savior. That we're not good with just being where we're at. We're not good with just being good. We're not good with the routine. We're, 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 we're a people that are passionate and we believe that, that God has called us to change the world around us through his glory. Do you know what I mean? So when he says, I, I, I urge you, there's something in me. I want you to understand how important this is. By the mercies of God, that mercy that he bestowed on you to present your body as a living and holy sacrifice. That, that presentation is, here I am. Here I am. Here I am. In every dark corner of my life, every dark corner of my brain, the things I do when nobody's looking, the way I judge that person, that family member that I don't get along with, the thing I should have done and didn't do. Like, here I am. I present myself, God. I stand before you to let your light shine in my darkness and rip away every ounce of darkness in me. Holy and living sacrifice. Here I am. Ladies, y'all get this, right? Y'all understand. Because a lot of times, it, it's so uncomfortable and vulnerable to present yourself. But y'all do it all the time. Y'all say, do these shorts make my butt look big to your, butt, to your husbands? And we don't know what to answer. We're like, is this, is this a good big or a bad big? Like, what, what do we do here? You know, we're like here in the headlights. We're like, are you tricking me? Am I about to be in some seat so you're presenting? Your, what, are these, what does this look like on me? And we go, we're like checking which way the wind's blowing. We're looking up for lunar eclipses. Like, what is the right answer right now? Because I don't know. We don't even believe in like like uh, 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 signs and stuff. We're like, she's a Libra. She's a Libra. What what is she gonna say? I don't I don't even believe in this. But I'm really scared right now. Am I being so? Guys don't understand that. Like, we're, we don't even get that vulnerable. We don't we don't come close to going like, here I am. We don't we don't do that. Can you imagine like, babe, just just look at me. Like, just take it all in. Let me. We don't do that. Like we, it's not even in our minds to go like, here I am. Here's all of me. Just, just take it all in. Like, it's uncomfortable. It's vulnerable to say, look at every piece of me. But we're not talking about people. We're not even talking about your spouse. We're not even talking about the things that make you uncomfortable. We're talking about a God that saved your soul and is begging us for holiness. I'm going to ask you, and this ain't a, I don't need weird answers because I, I don't want to know you like that. Like, I love y'all and we're cool, but like, what is the thing? What is the thing that when you stand before God, you know that you know that you know you haven't let go of yet? What is the thing that when he starts searching those dark corners of your life and you go, here I am, I'm presenting myself as a living and holy sacrifice. Is he going to hone in on? And I can't answer that for you. That's only that's only the thing. You, and this is where it gets uncomfortable. Because we can't just come into church and go, oh, that was fun. We shake some hands, hug some necks. See you next week. No, we have to come into church and realize that we are here to worship a almighty God that puts life in us, that takes what's dead and brings it to life, that takes what's dirty and makes it clean. And we start singing. He turns my mourning into dancing and we actually mean it. We start saying, no, no, no. He takes my ashes, this burnt dirt. And he turns it into beauty. And the words actually mean something. And it goes beyond singing songs on a screen. And it becomes actual worship to a living, breathing God. You guys there? You guys there? I don't know. I don't know. You know what I mean? So. He goes on to say. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. See, we think what we just did was worship. We sang some songs, that's worship. If you're not paying attention, we say this every week. At the end of the service, it's more of a send-off. Like when, when me and Chad were like, hey, let's do this thing, we're starting this thing, it's, uh, we feel like God's in it. Like, let's make sure that people understand. If you're not getting it, I hope you get it after we, we talk about it. That This, this isn't like our, what we do for worship. This is this right here at, at Three Acres is a 
is a recharge. Because what you do is worship as you live your life according to a God. So when you go into this world that's full of darkness, you are the light. This right here is just to recharge the light. Your real worship is what you do out there when you step away from all this, when you're alone and you're like living for Jesus. That's what that looks like. He says, this is your, your spiritual service of worship. It doesn't say, this is your spiritual volunteer of worship. Because when you're volunteering, it's just like you're on your own time. Like, yeah, I'm here for a couple hours. Cool, let me uh, take my Louis Vuitton purse and take a picture with this poor person serving them soup. That's not, that's not what we're doing. He says, this is your spiritual service of worship. And when, you're, when you talk about servanthood, there's a, there's a surrender involved that we don't like, again, because it's uncomfortable. And because we're American, we don't like to surrender to nothing. You know what I mean? Like, these colors don't run. That's what we like. We don't. Calm your mullets. It'll be cool. Like, it'll be it'll be cool. Like, we're not talking about that. Like, even the, the posture that you take when you come into worship, like, this just means that God, you're like, I, I'm not raising my hands. I say doing it. I might sing some songs on the, um, but I ain't raising my hand. The whole act of raising your hands is that's all you're doing is just, you're surrendering to God and saying, no, no, no. Here I am. I'm totally yours. Like, I'm just presenting myself. Like, this is it. Like, if somebody, well, the funny thing is, somebody drew a gun on you, <laughs> you'd raise your hands. When it comes to your God that gives you everything you need and gives you breath every single day and it supplies your every need, you're like, nah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I really want to surrender to all that. Now, I'll surrender some things. I'll surrender because I like this part and I'll surrender because I like this part of the Bible. But I don't know if everything, bro. Like, everything. Like, every, like my whole everything. Like, every thought. Every every time everything? Are y'all there? Are we here? Are we not here? I don't know. Are you there? I don't know. Here I am. Here I am. Surrender. Surrender. This is your spiritual service of worship, a servanthood. You're coming into worship God because you believe He is that big. Or you don't, I don't know. Again, this is what we're trying to figure out. We're trying to we're trying to weigh those options. Like, where are you at, man? I don't I can't tell you that. This is this whole deal is for us to, to again, again. The, the Bible isn't binoculars. It's a mirror, right? We're looking at this and going, oh, I don't know if I like what I see. Because I'm reading this and my life isn't lining up with this. Like in every other church I've been to, that's like, they don't care. Like, I don't, we just don't want to be like that. We're going to care. We want to come together as a family. And like, again, iron sharpen iron. We want to grow each other and go, hey, man, I have a problem. And we don't go, bro, that dude over there has problems. We want to go, no, 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 let's pray. Let's pray. Because you know what? Because I'm jacked up. And I've been there, bro. I've been right on my face. I've walked for Jesus and been like, I love Jesus. And then something shiny catches my attention. And I'm like, oh, boom, right on my face. That's where I'm at. And I could have stayed down there, but I love Jesus too much. I understand how real he is. And there's no way I can look at him and go, you know what? I can just live my life however I want. There's no way I look at him and watch what he does in this world and how the spirit moves and how the spirit transforms us and go, I have to be different. There's no way I can stay the same because I really believe it. I really believe it. So let me look in this mirror and figure out what I need to change because I just want to be where he's at. You know, I just want to grow close to him. Thank you. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. So, so we're the body. We're the body of Christ. And again, back to the, you don't have to go to church guy, right? We're back, back to this guy. Like we are the body and I've seen the spirit of God. Just draw people to him. Like, I've seen it. And that's how it works, right? He draws people to him. And we're not talking about salvation here. We're kind of talking about sanctification. Like, what's next? Okay, everybody. I came to know God. We're here to get people saved. Yep, we got 17 people saved. That's, okay, what'd you do with them afterward? Well, I, I don't know. They came to know God. And, and this is what we're talking about. Like, the sanctification. I've never seen the Spirit of God draws people to him. But the body of Christ is what God uses to help people grow. So they, they, they come to know God, but through the body is how they become sanctified. Through watching your life, through those conversations you have. The, the time when people call and you answer the phone and they're just like, my life's a wreck. And you know scripture because you've been in your word to guide them to know who Jesus is, to know more about him because you believe and now the whole church is being transformed because everybody's just pouring into people. We're all just pouring into each other because somebody said, here I am. Like, God, all this dark stuff, just help me get rid of it because I want to grow with you. So your name can be glorified through my life. That's the thing. God saves you, not just because he loves you, and he does. And it's not just for you. 
because we're super selfish about that. Oh, God saved me because he loves me. But yes, God saved you because he loved you so his name can be glorified so people can see his glory and go, what is that? And then they can come to know him and then God can glorify himself through their body and God can be glorified again and somebody else can go, what is that? And it's yeah. this constant, it's this constant glory of God being shown in the world through your lives. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your body as living and holy sacrifices, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's be honest. This world, we look at it, and it's real easy just to be like, that's cool. Oh, yeah, yeah that's cool, too. I mean, that's not really me, but that's cool. Like, oh, yeah, that's cool. He says, don't, don't be conformed. Don't let the world shape you because the world's eyes are just on themselves. Throughout history, throughout the entire Bible, when God really came in and just like destroyed entire cities, it was because the entire city was very into seeking one's self-pleasure. It was all about their eyes on them and their eyes never on God. This entire Bible, the entire Old Testament pointed to the cross this way. The entire New Testament and what we're doing points to the cross this way. Everything was met at the cross and the sacrifice that Jesus made. That's what he does. The idea is keeping our eyes on that cross and what was done in that moment of sacrifice. Because the world will teach you. Just look, you're good. It's, it's all, do you do you, baby. You do you is what they say. And Jesus is like, I never said that. It was never about you. It was always about his glory. It was always about killing, like dying to self so that others may be raised. It's about serving other people. That's the whole idea of Christianity. Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. You with me? It was never about you. Don't be conformed by the ways of the world. This, this, this world is very selfish. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Making your mind new. When's the last time you just sat down to do that? When's the last time you just got in your word because you don't like the way you think? When's the last time you read your Bible and you said, well, I think this way and the Bible says this way. And a lot of times people go, well, I'm going to go with me. Because you're being conformed by the ways of this world. The only way you, you make your mind new is being in the presence of God. In the presence of God, the Spirit of God lives in those pages and also lives in each one of you. That's the weirdest thing in the world. Of all the things Jesus could have put his spirit in, of all the things in the whole world, he put it in you. And what are you doing with it? Don't be, don't be conformed by the ways of the world. Don't be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Again, when I speak, my whole goal is just, how do we apply the stuff that we're reading to our lives? As we read and we pray and we change so that other people may see who Jesus is through your life because God chose you as a temple that he put his spirit in, you know? So this dude totally stole my tattoo and uh, I was super hot about it. It's been about 20 years, I'm still mad. And um, I, uh, I was waiting tables just sold out like right i'm just like i'm i'm being this christian punk rocker right i'm just in this scene i gotta look the part i need this whole sleeve tattoo i was starting off here and and uh uh, uh I, i'm waiting tables and i look over and there's this girl at this table and she has this giant koi fish tattooed down her leg and i go where have i seen that koi fish before again i was in houston now at this point i'm in texas city waiting tables seen that koi fish if you remember back in that other story i'm flipping through this portfolio book that this dude left and he took everything he left everything in the world that was important to him family included took my dang tattoo so i go that koi fish was in that guy's portfolio weird random thing i'm still actually friends with this girl to this day but this is how we met she has a giant koi fish tattoo on her leg and I, she wasn't even my table she was somebody else's table i run up to this table and i go yo you know, blah, 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 so-and-so, this tattoo artist, fourth best in Texas that year. And um, I, I go, I go, and she goes, yeah, that's my buddy, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, 
Ooh, well, and I go through the whole story, right? I'm just throwing up on this girl. And she goes, oh, you didn't hear? And I go, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I heard. I heard. He done ran off to Canada with no butterfly. And, um, and she goes, no, 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 you didn't hear? And I'm like, hear what? She goes, they came back to Houston. I'm like, oh, yeah? And she goes, yeah. Her ex-boyfriend found them, killed them both. And my first thought was, are you kidding me? I'm never going to get this tattoo. Because that's where I was at 21, right? Just straight up murder in the middle of the sermon. And I'm not even joking. This, I'm just, I didn't make any of this up. People think I do and they start Googling stuff and they're like, oh my God, you did not make this up. I'm like, I didn't. Murder. Every single time I save up for another tattoo. Like, I, People got murdered and I was still like, I'm getting this tattoo, right? I'd save... $287. I'm like, oh, this is, this is it's going to be big, all the color. I get a speeding ticket for $287. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm back. I got another $195. Something would happen. Oh, this bill would come in. It'd be $195. I'm like, are you kidding me? Okay, I get it. I get it. I say all that to say I get altars, man. I was sold out on the altar of punk rock. You know, like, I'm, I'm here, God, to make my sacrifice. We, un we understand altars. We go, here, the, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself on the altar of my work. And that's all I really care about. I'm putting myself on the altar of this scene. I'm putting myself on the altar of money. I'm putting myself on the altar of culture because I have to keep up with the Joneses. I have to look like this. I have to dress like this. I have to drive that certain truck. I put myself on this altar of select baseball. Whoa. I'm just playing. Don't be, you can't be talking like that in Santa Fe. I'll get hit with the, I'll be walking on the road and get hit with the baseball. People do not play about select baseball around here. I'm putting my life on this altar. Like we get altars. Here's the thing. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. He was the ultimate sacrifice. Back in the day, these priests would cut up these animals and they'd sprinkle their, every time I talk, I'm always talking about killing animals. I don't know. I really don't dislike animals. I'm pro. Um, and, and, and. And he's, they would kill animals and bring up the altar. People would bring their, their most cherished livestock, the best of the best. They'd come and say, this is my sacrifice. And that priest would be like, cool, Wah! just kill him, right? And the, or hay or wheat or whatever. They'd bring the best. But Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. So we don't have to do that anymore. So a lot of us are like, no, we don't, we don't got to do that. Jesus, there, there's nothing in the Bible about ever taking altars away. This altar was in the middle of this temple. And the temple where the Spirit of God was. And now the Spirit of God is... Where? In each and every one of you. So the altar, we, we put things on this altar. See, the problem is we want the power of God. We want God to move. We want God to bless us. We want, we want, we want to see God. We want the goosebumps in worship. And back in the day, they brought their best. Like, it, it, the, the Bible never says anything about not bringing anything to the altar. It says you come into his courts with thanksgiving and praise, and most of us can barely even sing. Like, ah, oh, cool, just let us hurry up so I can sit back down. Like, we, we come to God empty-handed, but we want so much from Him. This altar, sometimes, maybe it's just, we got to come with worship. we got to come and surrender. we got to come with a different posture, understanding that He is mighty. He is king. He is big. He is our God, and not just another word that we throw around. Like, He is something bigger than what we make Him. He never said we never had to stop bringing things. He said Jesus was that ultimate blood sacrifice. When you come to God, what are you bringing? Just all he asked for is an open heart and some worship. To understand who he is. Do you really understand who he is? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish reading this. He says, By the renewing of your mind, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed by the ways of this world, but be transformed. Made something new like you've never been. I once was this, and now I'm something different. Totally. Guys, get it. We played with Transformers when we were little. I'm a truck. I'm a truck. I'm a truck. Oh, my God, I'm a robot. Like, we understand this. And it's something completely different. The only problem with Transformers is they go back. We shouldn't go back. You should be forever changed. Do you really know your Jesus? Because once you taste of how good he really is, how do we go back? 
You know what I'm saying? Don't be conformed, but be transformed by the ways, um, see, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, which is good and perfect and acceptable and perfect. That's it, right? When you come to know Jesus, that's your, the question. We go, what do I do now? I know God. I know God. Like, what do, what do I do now? Okay, I'm at church. I'm coming to church every weekend. Feels like the same thing. What, what do I do now? Like, I want to be good. I want to be perfect. I want to be acceptable. How do, I, how do I stand before my God and he looks at me and goes, no, that's good. That's very acceptable. That's perfect. He just, he just told you to present your body as a living and holy sacrifice. Like he says, this is how you get here. Because when we stand before God, I mean, that's the whole point, right? That's the whole point of knowing him is to go like, God, here I am. Like, I just want to be good. Like, I just want to be clean. I just want to be cleansed. I just want to be holy. We have a problem with that word holy because we don't really get it. We don't understand holiness, right? And the thing is that like the spirit of God lives in you. lives in you. So that's what makes you holy. That's what cleans you. That's what makes you good. That you can mess up and you just get right back up. And I don't want to take advantage of my God's grace. I just don't. But it, there's nowhere that I can run that I'm going to outrun his grace. It's just not going to happen. So I don't know where you're at today in your life. But if you need a little grace, it's there. With the same understanding of here I am, God. I, I'm a, again, old sacrifices, right? I just want to be perfect before you. Well, this is what you do. You present your body. And you don't be conformed. You don't think like the world. You don't think everything's good. It's all good. You understand your word of God. You understand what he poured into you. You understand what, what these guys were writing about. And that's how you transform your mind into something new. You, you figure out that your altar is about, literally, like people were, people were murdered. And I'm like, no, I'm still in on this tattoo thing. It, because maybe sometimes the wrong things are important in our lives. Here's the thing. Old Testament, animal sacrifice, blood, pop, 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 right? They just threw these dead carcasses on an altar and said, it's good. Here's the thing. He says, this whole time he's screaming, be a living, be a living, be a living sacrifice. Here's the thing about living sacrifices. You have to put yourself on that altar and you can get off whenever you want. The dead sacrifices never moved once they were there. The living ones, you say, here I am. Here I am. Here I Ooh, what's that? This feels good. This looks good. This tastes good. This is shiny. Oh, I forgot. I'm back over here. You have to choose to never get off this altar. You have to choose to say, here I am. I am a living sacrifice. I can move whenever I want. Living sacrifice and get off the altars whenever they want. You have to make a decision that this world is not going to move me. These feelings are not going to move me. This... Loneliness is not going to move me. This depression is not going to move me. This whatever it is that you struggle with is not going to move me. I'm going to stand before my God and present myself living and holy and say, God, here I am. You search every corner of my life, every piece of my brain. Here I am. That's it. You're a living sacrifice. You make the choice to get on or off that altar. Your life is a response to what you think God is. What does that look like? These guys are gonna come play? Ready. I'm gonna ask you guys to stand. As you worship, I want you to kind of figure out where you're at with God. And I want you to figure out where you want to be. We don't do this a lot here, but I'm totally pro this thing I'm going to ask Mr. Chad Hussey I'm going to ask Miss Dandy to come up here I'm going to ask Miss Ann to come up here I don't know what you're walking through they're going to stand here and we're all going to worship and we're going to sing and we're going to come in, in a servant attitude and we can raise our hands if we want we can sing to our God, you can deal with it on your own but here's the deal about being a part of a body you don't have to deal with it on your own if you need prayer if you're like, I've had this thing that I need to get over, you don't have to tell us. You're like, just pray for me. Because there's something about two or more being gathered. So you go up to one of these people. 
And if you're in this audience and somebody comes up and you just want to surround them with love because you care about this family, put your hands on their back and pray for them. It's going to be okay, I promise. We can do that. Prayer changes things. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, to present your body as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. You are a living sacrifice. Make the choice to never get off this altar. I'm going to shut up. I stinking love y'all. Amazing ways. I'm sweet and sweet. That's it.